Bing. Okay. So what I do is audio. I think you froze. No, I'm good. All oh right. no, you're there. You were looking I'm down. Froze. Yeah, yeah. I was looking down. <laughs> You froze okay. yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> that just was funny. Okay, so you're you're in Minnesota. Right. Must be cold there. It was 45 yesterday and it, I mean in 50 the day before unusually warm for here, so I took full advantage, went for walks. It was great. Excellent. Oh, we're both in blue. Yeah, really look at that are we gonna be just audio though we are just audio i am do i do zoom so that there's video too because i do have a dedicated youtube channel for the podcast and i've i've only uploaded one video to it yet i don't really know what i'm doing with it yet but i have this concept so i'm percolating what to do like I've seen some podcasts that have video too, because some guests or some audience or listeners or whatever you want to call them, um, they like the video instead or in addition, but no one's going to want to listen to the podcast twice. So, and then I thought- well, they might, I, they might, they might say, I want to know what that person looks like. You know, they might, who knows? They might, I, I don't, I don't know. And then I was thinking about maybe doing a Patreon thing and like having- a little audience support just to defray some of the costs. Not that the podcast cost me much money, but I'm, you know, trying to sell books and pay myself back for the publishing cost of the book. So I thought, you know, I support three or four different artists on Patreon, but they all produce something that they give the patrons that's above and beyond. And I, I don't know what that would be. And I don't know if just giving them a subscription to the YouTube channel for this is something that they would want. You know what I mean? Or a copy of your book. Well, that I could definitely do. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. See, you got to talk about these things. All right, all right. This is all on the recording and I will cut all of this out. So let's, let's well, just. Why don't you, why don't you stop recording now? And then That's start fine. Again. I'm just going to, I, I do all the tech myself. So I'll just put it in iMovie and chop off the old, the beginning. It's no big deal. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am thrilled that you are here today. I have Tina Feigl here from Minnesota. She is um, an amazing woman. Tina is uh, the Director of Family Engagement at A New Family Services in St. Paul, Minnesota. You're going to love this woman. She is a former school psychologist, a mother of three wonderful sons and their equally wonderful spouses, a grandmother of four spunky grandchildren, Tina's passion is bringing peace to homes and schools by helping adults to heal challenging child behavior with the specific and highly effective present moment parenting. Since 2000, which was 20 years ago, believe it or not, she has operated her business, the Center of the Challenging Child, now a branch of Anu Family Services. As a coach and trainer of coaches, Tina supports adults in applying these techniques in her books, Present Moment Parenting, The Guide to Peaceful Life with Your Intense Child, which was the winner of the 2017 Mom's Choice Gold Award and available on Amazon and Audible, and her ebook, Healing the Heart of Your Traumatized Child, available on Amazon. Amazon. Um, Tina trains parent coaches as part of her vision that every adult who wants a parent coach can pick up the phone and find one. She's been featured in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Care 11 TV's Extra Super Nanny, um, and you can learn more about parent coaching and coach training at her website, www.parentingmojo.com. Wow. Wow. So she's had this, you've had this business for 12 years. So for, um, and for eight of them, you're, you're working with a new, which is a, a treatment foster care agency. Yes. That's, that's huge. I, I, I think what you're doing is amazing work. Welcome to the show, Tina. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Thank you, Marcy. I'm thrilled too. I just love that all your energy is just wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. It's a, it's passion and motivation and a little caffeine especially on a <laughs> friday afternoon we're taping this on a friday in december and uh it's exhausting teaching all week and then 
but this is what I was looking forward to all day. So I couldn't wait to actually meet you. And, you know, thank goodness for Zoom, because otherwise these kinds of things wouldn't be possible. I'd have to fly to Minnesota and, you know. I just I love how it connects us all. And I, I do a lot of my coaching, all my training on Zoom too. And I just love how easy it is to just yeah. be with people. I love it. How did we live without it before? I don't even know. Exactly. It's crazy. All right. Now the level on the mic is doing a little weird thing here. You're cutting out a little. Um, okay. So how did you become a parenting coach? I know you had a little yeah. bit of a journey in with that. Yes, I, uh, I was a school psychologist and I was doing evaluations for emotional behavioral disorders in children. And I thought if I could just get to the adults who love and care for and teach these children, we wouldn't have to have so many of these evaluations. So I just pretty much back in 2000 hung my shingle and prayed. <laughs> and then it was even before spam. So I sent some spam emails. Right. And and started speaking and then collecting people's email addresses with my clipboard and pen and started a newsletter and have been writing monthly since then to all the people wow. on the list. And yeah, that's how it happened. I just like, just leapt. And I, I really made parent coaching up in my mind because I didn't know anybody else who was coaching parents at that time. So I just made it up. Well, you know, it, it seems like such, such a no brainer. Like, of course we need parent coaching. You know, and, and I think that I've heard a lot of people through the course of my lifetime saying similar things like, why aren't there parent coaching? You know, you have instruction for almost uh, an instruction available for almost every single thing that you're going to do as an adult, except the single most important thing you do as an adult, and that is raise a child. I couldn't agree with you more, which is why I dedicate my life to it and train other people to do it too. I've trained about 500 people to be parent coaches and it just gives me such joy to know that people can pick up the phone and find a coach. That's awesome. So how did you learn how to do this? You you were in school to become a life coach and then sort of deviated from that. And what did you do to prepare yourself? Well, I just did a lot of reading and I used my own personal experience and I uh, I just, as I went through this process, I just kept gathering, you know, like tumbleweed, getting more and more and more information, ended up writing a book and then I wrote another book and then wrote another book. And it just all kind of came together in a beautiful way. I, it was almost effortless. And I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. And I, I just feel like I have insight into the heart of the child and I can explain that to the parents. And it's just something that I have. Whisperer. Yeah, That's kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So, so a new family services from when I was looking at the website seems like a, um, like a hub for all sorts of services for foster care and adoptive parents and um, biologically connected adjacent families who are raising kids. Is, am I getting that right? Yes, yes, yes. And we coach parents who are also at risk of having their children removed. So the biological parents to begin with, then right. if, if they're in foster care, we coach foster parents. If they're adopted, we coach adopted parents. And uh, I actually am the only one in the organization. We have about 18 coaches right now. And I'm the only one who also does private pay. So anybody who wants parent coaching can come to me. So wow. it's, it's a full service place. And we have something called intensive permanence services too, where one of our workers forms a relationship with the child and helps them do their grief, loss and trauma work. So that's wow. a very powerful thing. We have fabulous treatment, foster care, social workers who help get them set up and, and support them during the time that they're fostering the children. And uh, we also have flexible support, which is if people just need help with their lives to get themselves on their feet, to be better parents and to be better humans in the world, to just be more successful, I should say, we have that service as well. So it's, it's pretty broad ranging. And right now we're even working on a youth coaching program. So it, it to just train, keeps... to train the, the adolescents to help other kids. Nope. Uh, coach, adults who coach the youth on their lives. Oh, 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 I misunderstood. Okay, wow. 
So. Yeah, I think I could have used that as a teenager. <laughs> if that something like that was around, that would have served me very well. Yes, I, especially so in hard know. times, you know, kids struggle so much. So yeah, it's just the time is right. So yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. And then you can sidestep all of that, the angst and the missteps and the mistakes and the the things that kids do in their late adolescence and their in their twenties that sort of screw them up for a few decades or more. Right, right. Because they just don't have fully formed prefrontal cortexes where they think ahead about what the con consequences might be and they, they plan better and you know, it the brains aren't there, you know, so that's why they get themselves in trouble. So right. if we can help them be mindful by coaching them, it's just you know, we can help them develop some of those skills that are on their way to developing and kind of speed it up a little bit. So and then you're setting them up so that they're raising the next generation better. So it's like a multi-generational boost here. You know, this is hugely epic. Yes, it is. It's It feels so fun to be part of an organization that is so innovative all the time. And I, I, I can't tell you what an experience this has been for the last eight and a half years of being with people who are so open hearted about everything. And, and yeah, let's do that, you know, kind of thing. It's really fun. That's wonderful. It, it, very different than being in a school system where there's such a hierarchy and, of administration and levels and rules and laws and all sorts of things that are important to have, but sort of limit the reach that a social worker or a teacher could have in a kid's life. Exactly. And I, that's why I love coaching, too, because there aren't limits on it as far as we do have our role, but we can really do whatever we need to do for these parents. You know, it's just a, a fabulous relationship. They come to trust us and we see them more often than a case manager, for instance, if the, if the family's involved in the child protection system. We know the family so much better and we can give the strengths to the case manager and the whole team who's around them. And it's, it, there's trust. And in fact, one mom said it so beautifully. She sat around at a team meeting where there are counselors and social workers and crisis interventionists and therapists, you know, who, for the child, for the mother, for the father, for, you know, whoever is there at the team meeting that's trying to help school personnel as well. And she looked around the room and she said, you are the only one who is just for me. And where should the effort be going? <laughs> you know, it, it should be in the parent so that we can keep them together with their children so their children don't have to grieve that loss and then act it out. You know, that they act their grief. They don't talk their grief. They act it out and then they get in trouble. Then they get moved from home to home because Which their just behavior... causes more grief and more trauma and more, right. And it's just a cyclical downward spiral. Exactly, exactly. So we can stop that. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful. As you're talking, it, it made me think um, um, recently, my husband and I watched the, the Netflix mini series called The Queen's Gambit. Yes, we watched it too. Right. So I was thinking while you were talking that the main character whose name just suddenly flew out of my head would have benefited from this in in uh, in more ways than I could quantitatively ever express. I mean, her parents died, and she was just sort of like shoved in this nursing home, in this this uh, this um, I almost said nursing home, but what I meant was orphanage. Thank you. Um, and then drugged and just sort of left there with like no counseling and no explanation and no like no wonder she was a little off, you know. No wonder. No wonder. And that's exactly what my thoughts were too. I wish I could have gotten to some adults in her life, you know, it's just fiction, but that's what I always think, you know, get to these adults because we can actually really make a difference and change the trajectory of that life. Yeah. Amazing. Can you, um, going back to your bio a little bit, we were talking about your book. Um, can you explain your present moment parenting concept? I sure can. Uh, it's, really about how much of parenting is thinking about the past, what that child has done before, even yesterday or a minute ago, and worrying that that thing is going to be carried into the future when we really don't have the past. It's gone. We right. can't change it. And the future is not here yet, and we can't jump ahead and be in it. 
So where is our power? It's right here in the present moment with the child. And what can we do with the present moment? We can download a success into that child's heart. We can say to that child, when you, I feel because on some kind of positive experience that they're having right now that we're observing and actually change the neural pathways of that child to feel connected to the parents. And then after they say, when you, I feel because, which would be like when you speak to your brother in such a nice tone of voice, I feel on top of the world because it just shows me what a great big brother you know how to be. And if you listen to that, it's so much different than good job talking nicely to your brother, right? Of course. And so that's the phrase I use that I, I used to teach at the college level. And it was from an assertiveness training book that I was teaching from. And in that book, you can use it for positives and negatives. But I just took it to use it for positives to actually change how that brain is functioning. So what the parent puts in that heart goes to the brain. And um, HeartMath Institute actually proved this, that what we put into the heart goes up into the brain. And if we yeah. strengthen those neural pathways, which is all learning by repetition, sure. then, then that's who the kid is. We get to, we get to formulate who the, child's, who the child is by changing their bodies. You know, and some parents have said to me, I don't know if I want to be responsible for the neural pathways of my child. Too late, and, you already are. That's exactly what I say. You are anyway, so might as well make it happen in a way that really works for everybody, uh, makes parents relaxed and kids relaxed around them and draws them to the parents instead of pushing them away. So one of my th things that I talk about is that with every action, we're actually drawing a child to us or pushing them away. And so if we are so pre present in this moment, we can ask ourselves, was that a drawing toward or was that a pushing away? And then we can become more conscious of the way communication affects the child. And I'm very physiological in my approach, as you can tell, I'm talking about neural pathways and hearts sure. and brains. And that's really where the answer lies. There's, there's really, you know, so many people will talk about behavior as being disrespectful. And it's really not that. It's really not that. It's, it has to do with the amygdala and how it is the threat alarm in the brain. And if the child is not seen by those people upon whom he or she is dependent for survival, the amygdala fires and says, get their attention. Right. Any way you know how. Any way you know how, because you got to survive. And the amygdala way overdoes its job. Even when a child has been removed from a home and is quote unquote safe in a foster home, or if a child's been through any kind of experience and is safe in the home, they get food and shelter and clothing and, you know, education and transportation and all the things they need, medical care. The brain can't tell unless that primary parent actually really sees this kid. Right. And so the acting out happens sort of out of the blue, as people will say. And it's not out of the blue. The acting out is the amygdala saying, see me, see me, see me, see me, so I survive. Now, is it still a reaction or um, a function of the amygdala if it's, if the child feels emotionally not seen from the parent, even if all of the basic, you know, um, Maslow higher order of needs things are taken care of you know like yeah. you have the shelter and the food and the roof over your head and an education you know what I'm saying we're talking about emotional safety absolutely yes Marcy you picked right up on that yes yeah well so that was me <laughs> is there an an age where or an age range that this is the most most effective like if you're coming in as a trying to to uh, do an intervention and correct a behavior or correct the pathway that a parent and child team are going on? Is there an age range of the child where this becomes more effective or less effective? Well, I've seen effectiveness with all ages of children. My age range um, is six months to 52 years, the children, the parents. Oh, good. So it's wide children. open. <laughs> <laughs> and really, it, 
it doesn't ever stop being important that your parents see you. I, my kids are all yeah. adults and they still need to be seen by me, you know, and and yeah. not as much as they did when they were kids. They're fully grown, you know, they're, they are self-referential now instead of re parent referential. But, you know, a lot of adults walking around who are still feeling the pain of their parents not seeing them, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I was uh, working on the second draft of my memoir that I published, Permission to Land, um, my dad and I were having a lot of very deep conversations about things that happened in the long ago past. Um, he had picked up the first draft, like right after Thanksgiving last year, and not only was shocked that he was in it, which I thought was kind of funny, but he was also shocked that anything he had ever done when I was a teenager during the divorce with my mom, he was shocked that he had any culpability in hurting me in any way. Like he didn't realize the depth of pain he caused by his behavior. And I had sort of learned to let it go in therapy because there wasn't anything I could do to change it. And I decided to just accept my dad for who he is and let all that stuff go. And as you just put so eloquently, I've become self-referential and self-healing and learned all sorts of things and strategies through, through therapy and writing. And so I, I no longer really needed that. I, I was okay without it, but um, we had a very long, very painful over the course of a month kind of conversation. And uh, it, it was like throwing rubbing alcohol in an open wound. It hurt so badly for both of us, but we healed 90% uh, of all of those wounds that had been just sort of ignored. You know, you push them in the corner of the room and you ignore them and move on because there isn't anything you can do about them. Um, but it, it was it was cathartic and fabulous for both of us. We were really able to heal a lot of that. And I finally felt seen by him. And that 15-year-old girl who felt like her daddy didn't love her finally got to realize that he did. He was just in his own pain and couldn't see past his own needs at the moment to see her, but he saw her now. And it was huge. Huge. I just saw your face while you, I mean, you guys listening at home didn't see Tina's face, but she just felt what I felt. So yeah, it was amazing. Really sounds like a miracle. It's fabulous. It, it just sounds unbelievable. I'm so happy that that happened for you. It's like that stuff that gets shoved under. If you break it open and let it come out instead of clamping it down your whole life, if you clamp it down, it comes out sideways in your life. It, it just does. It's kind of guaranteed to. And yeah. so many parents are like your dad. They have no concept of the enormous effect they're having on their children, which is why I dedicate my life to this, because I want to show them that they are having an effect and it can be healed. You know, it, th there's lots they can do to make a difference in it. And here and now, if your child is 17, it's not too late. You know, right. if your child is 20, it's not too late. You can still do this work. Yeah. And I think it all comes, not all, but a lot of it comes down to the language and the word choice that we use. Like you were talking about that, those, that, those phrases, the sentence starter that you used. Um, which was better than just saying, oh, I like how you did that, but showing them, giving them the emotional intelligence and the vocabulary to be able to really explain specifically what's in their heart and what they're thinking is invaluable, you know. It really is. And they, they oftentimes will say to me, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. And that's the role of a coach. You know, I don't have to diagnose people with anything wrong. I just help them think of things they didn't think of. Just <laughs> teach them a new way. And who right. gets born knowing this stuff? You know, no, I wasn't born no. knowing this stuff. And I, I love sharing it with people just because it's just simply something they didn't know before. There's no blame involved for the parents. Right. You know, and I they just that. weren't raised with the tools. And this isn't taught in school. You know, I, I think even if you, I mean, I, uh, we both went through uh, college courses to, uh, to be able to go into the schools and do what we were going to do. You were a school psychologist. I've been an English teacher for 26 years and wow, 26 years. And, um, you know, they, they taught me how to deliver a lesson, how to teach a piece of literature or how to teach kids where commas go. 
um, even classroom management techniques, like getting kids to work together in groups and so on, but they don't really teach you how to motivate them to do the thing or how to not feel frustrated by challenge. You know, I, I have always called it frustration tolerance, but it's really resilience. You know, uh, how we don't teach people how to foster that in other people. We don't teach them how to foster it in themselves, let alone anyone else. Really, and it's it's about it's about an effective relationship between two people, actually. You know, and it's the steps to it aren't that hard, but you don't, as a teacher, you don't get taught how to do this. And when you think about it, you know, people say who had the most effect on you when you were a kid, and so many adults will say it was my English teacher in high school. You know, and, and it was that for me too. I had an English teacher who just absolutely formed a personal relationship with me. So therefore I learned from her. Sure. So it is about relationship and we don't have relationship 101 in educational education, do we? I mean, we just don't do no, that. No, and, and some teachers just keep a, a barrier or a, a very strict boundary between themselves and their students, you know, where they, they don't really let them know anything personal about them because they feel like, you know, we need to have the professor pupil sort of relationship and, and that may work for them, but that never worked for me. You know, I, 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 I expect respect because I give respect. Yes. Um, but and that's I, how kids learn it. That's right. And, and I like, I like to tell them things about me. You know, I mean, age appropriate, relationship appropriate, but, you know, I don't hide the fact that my mother was a drug addict. I don't hide the fact that she attempted suicide a bunch of times. I don't hide the fact that my parents were divorced and it was an awful trying process and I was an only child for a long time. Like, I don't, I don't hide any of that because I think it humanizes me and allows the kids to realize she's not full of shit. She knows sort of what she's talking about. She's been where I've been. And if I need somebody, she's probably safe. Yes, and you just described vulnerability there, which is, you know, not a weakness. It's an incredible strength to yeah. be vulnerable with the kids in your world. And that's another part of present moment parenting. Just be vulnerable, be a human with them, include them in your thought processes and include them in family discussions about how we're going to operate. So family meetings are a really big piece of it as well. Yeah. So that you know, you don't have to maintain that authoritarian role your whole time, which only generates rebellion. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so vulnerability is a huge strength. When people can be vulnerable, they draw people toward them. They open up like you did, Marcy, yeah. as a teacher. Just, oh, she's like me. Okay, now I'm going to really learn from her. I can trust her. You know, that's what right. we're about. I tell, tell kids this, you know, like... Uh... And they, you know, they ask me questions and I don't, I don't ever pull any punches. Like I'm totally fine with sharing almost anything. No one's ever actually asked me anything that was something like I wasn't, wasn't willing to share. Um, but I, I become school mom for a lot of kids yes. and, and, and a lot of them need it. And, and I, yeah. some of my greatest friends in the world right now are former students of mine who've been to weddings and, and bar mitzvahs and, you know child baptisms and birthday parties and you know it's just an amazing an amazing experience 90 percent of what i love the most about this job is the connection with people beautiful <laughs> that's so beautiful it's they're amazing. so lucky to have you <laughs> thank you and, and this is part of why why teaching in COVID is so difficult because oh, we're yes. not between the masks and the kids being freaked out and everybody being socially distant and six feet apart and the desks have barriers on them. So the kids, <coughs> excuse me, are, are more reserved, anxious, afraid of talking even. Even their social communication with each other is at a minimum. And I mean, I, I came into my class the other day and they were actually, my honors class was actually socializing with each other. And I, I had tears in my eyes because I haven't heard their voices. You know, it's just, I, 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 I'm concerned a little more than concerned about the long-term effects of this short-term, long-term trauma, you know? 
Yes, and we do have to be really sensitive, especially teachers are, and parents are going to have to be responsive as they re, readjust to being together. It, it'll happen. You know, their, their brains are pretty, what we call plastic, which means flexible. Sure. So they've adjusted to this. They can adjust to being back together again, but there might be new appreciations that they, things they had taken for granted before that they now really appreciate. So I see there's some gifts in this as well. Like they can look back and say, I was resilient enough to recover. Yeah. And I really appreciate my teachers and I really appreciate the school building and my friends that mean so much to me. You know, I just think that we're going to see some big gifts in it as well. And I think a little bit more, um, you know, as adolescents would sort of naturally yearn to pull away from their parents to forge their own individualism and their own identity. I I think that for a, lo- a large number of them, there's a, a like a resurgence in love for family and enjoying time at home, you know, that I think is, is going to be a really big, important takeaway for them as they go out into the world. I agree with you completely. I mean, we've been such an individualism kind of society. Uh, You know, get away from your family as fast as you can and form your own life and get a big job and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And don't look back kind of feeling, you know. Um, But I I think that's how we wind up with a divisive country like we have now. Not that I want to politicize this conversation at all. But, you know, in the last, I would say in my lifetime, in the last 50 some art years, there's been a huge shift from having this outlook of community support and I'm going to do things in my life, maybe a little personal sacrifice on my part, because it's going to help you because it's going to help someone else's family too. And, and I see less of that now. Yes, and I, I did my seventies when I was growing up. Me too. Me too. And, and I, I think it, there might be a switch here, a swing, the pendulum will always swing, won't it? And so I think we are going to see more of a let's come together and help each other out kind of feeling because that's what's been happening. You know, we're helping each other out by wearing masks and distancing from each other, oddly enough. I mean, it's a paradox, but it's we're caring. Right. Right. It's a paradox that we have to hold at the same time. Yeah. I love you and I want you here. But because I want you here, I have to push you away for now. Exactly. Right. I have to keep you over there. Right. Right. Yeah. I was telling, I, you know, I, I battle with some of the kids, even I teach 11th and 12th grade and, and sometimes they're not fully aware. I, I, I don't know about that, but they, their masks slip below their nose. And so, you know, CDC, DOH, we have to tell them to put their masks, wear them the right way. And, and I said, you know, I'm not telling you this to be punitive or to, to yell at you or gotcha about something. When I tell you, I want you to wear your mask the right way. It's me saying, I love you because I want you to be safe. And, and you have the courage to say, I love you in school. Yeah. Which I, is I love them like they're my own kids because for 41 minutes a day, they are my kids. Exactly. That's so beautiful. I remember doing trainings in school to staff and administration, and I said, "We, I'm going to use the L word. We're going to talk about love in public school." You know, right. I'm just so happy to hear you say that. Yeah, leave the classroom door open, and you say it in front of other people so that they don't individualize it. Of course, but you know, I mean, it's you know, they don't want it to be anyway. Let's not go there. <laughs> A limitation on our language is we only have one word for that, and it's there's seventy types of love, you know, so. Right. Yeah. So what do they say about the, about the, the, the language that Eskimos, that there's like 180 different words for snow? Yes. You know? Yes. It's like sort of the same concept, I think. It is. Okay. So um, um, I was looking, re- reading through some of the things that you were writing and you were saying that the, the concept of acting out had a physiological component. Was that what you were talking about with the amygdala before? Yes. It's the amygdala, the threat alarm, get their attention or you won't survive, act out. And the attention, positive or negative attention, it doesn't matter to the amygdala. It just right. get the attention. And so if they see you, you're going to survive. If they don't see you, you're not. So act out, do something. Or, or withdraw to get their attention. You can act in as well to get their attention. And that, that the amygdala is kind of a very fundamental place in the brain. You know, it just doesn't have a lot of 
nuance to it at all. Right. And it way overdoes its job. Just like in our area, we have maple trees and they drop these seed pods that look like helicopters and they drop <laughs> a bazillion more than they need to to propagate the species maple tree. And the amygdala does the same thing. This is nature trying to keep people alive is really and trees alive and you know all kinds of different organisms alive and we we have to realize we carry that our amygdala's fire too when we have something that scares us from our past sure. adults have it too they get their amygdalas get fired by the kids acting out you know so then we've got these battling amygdalas going on trying to each survive and be seen by the other person and it, and we can we can help modulate that so, so what do you think that parents get wrong most of the time when they're dealing with rebellious or oppositional children, when their amygdalas are firing? Yeah, they blame them. They consider it bad behavior or being morally bereft. You know, you just can't act like that in our family. You know, we don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't steal. You know, we don't swear like that. We don't. And it's, it's really actually all behavior is communication and all behavior is a readable signal and the signal always is see me. Right. So that's what you were talking about, morality. Now it makes sense to me. See, I'm learning. This is awesome. I love learning new things. They want to be seen. So that makes total sense to me now. So it relates to teaching and it relates to raising your kids and it, rela it relates to everything. It relates to you know, I would imagine since adults are just big kids anyway, it would relate to certain behaviors that might happen in a marriage or in an adult friendship. Probably the same thing. If you don't feel seen or you don't, you feel threatened in some way, you're going to act the same way. Exactly. People, people in any kind of relationship. Yeah. Interesting. But particularly vulnerable kids whose brains aren't fully developed and who are learning from their parents who they are in the world you know and it, it, that never stops they're always running an experiment on their parents who am i to you yeah. and if we tell them you matter and i love you and i care deeply and i'm not blaming you when you act out i realize you're just trying to be seen okay i'm going to see you i'm going to say when you i feel because and i'm going to reflect your feelings I'm going to say right now, this is really hard to do school this way. And you wish you could be back in the school five days a week and seeing your friends and being with them after school. You really wish that that's reflective listening. Yeah. And, and that is a seeing uh, method. And it is so effective. The amygdala calms down, the acting out goes away. And it has nothing to do with punishing them. Right. It's <laughs> it not punitive not at all. It's loving and accepting and vulnerable and communicative and verbally putting your arms around them. Exactly, exactly. Or physically putting your arms around them too, in both. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I was thinking students, you don't really hug them in this, in this right. time right now. Um, yeah. I, I felt like I, I was a single mom for a long time. My, my ex-husband and I got divorced when the kids were very small. And um, I kind of had like, we, we co-parented. So they spent some time at his house and the, the bulk of the week at my house. And when they would swing back and they'd be in my house again, the rules were different. And there was always a little bit of a pushback against that. Uh, Tuesdays was the swing day for us. And so Tuesdays, I, I knew that I always had to kind of keep my own adult plate clean because they were going to need me more because they were going to come back in with things that I just sort of didn't want to see them continue. You know, the rules were different. Yes. 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 I call that the re-entry from the other parents home. Yes. Yeah. It was always it's difficult. And then, you know, when they got a little older, they sort of got the routine, like, all right, we're allowed to do these things at dad's house, even though mom would never let us and we're not allowed, you know, so they would, not that I was super strict, but, you know, I always had rules like you have to do your have to's before you get to do any of your want to's. It's just the way life is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. and and I did a lot of what you said. I'm like I'm like patting myself on the back. I did a lot of what you said about letting the kids see the struggle and, you know, talking through how I was making decisions in an age appropriate way. But so that they they 
saw me as a fully dynamic human being. You know, I had moments when I was upset and up and like, I felt like my back was against a wall and moments that I was happy and everything in between. And, and I talked everything out with them and helped them problem solve what their feelings were and sort of invent the language or excavate the language so that they could fully explain what it is they were trying to get at, you know, like, I didn't just accept what'd you learn in school today? Nothing. You know, I didn't accept that. Um, but I remember I had one, one particular, I'm going to share with you one particular parent win that I had when my daughter was in fourth grade that I was very, very thrilled with. So she's in, she was in fifth grade, fifth grade, I believe. And she comes home from school, very dramatic that her two best friends in the whole world weren't talking to her that day because she started talking to this other girl who they didn't like. And they were upset that she was talking to them. And they said, well, you're, if you're going to be friends with us, you're not allowed to talk to her. And I held my breath as she was telling the story. And I'm like, oh crap, the the mean girl's going to start now. It starts now when they're 10, like inside I was panicking and, and I'm thinking, okay, now what'd you do? Tell me the rest of the story. So I said, so what was your reaction? Trying to like not feed into the emotionality of this that I was feeling. And she's just like, well, I just told them that they didn't have the right to tell me who I could be friends with. And if they didn't want to be friends with her, they didn't have to, but I thought they were being jerks. So I stopped talking to them first. I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> and she's standing there with her arms akimbo, you know, just telling yeah, yeah. me the story. And I was like, yes, I was so excited. I got the good kid, you know. <laughs> and, and what you did there, which I would, I would, coach a parent to do was that you were curious about her rather than you know you said well how did you react to that instead of saying those girls shouldn't have treated you that way this is horrible you didn't get into the fray of it you just interviewed her on her response you let her have the response right instead of imposing your own on and that is magic you know you just did such a beautiful thing there yay i was so excited i was so excited i think that a lot of well, you know, 30 years in therapy, analyzing yourself and analyzing your parents' performance really goes a long way in teaching you how to be a better parent, or at least it did for me. But also, there were some things that I learned in graduate school, um, like running a constructivist classroom and things like that, that really helped fine tune being responsive to an individual's needs and treating each situation and each kid because, you know, every kid's different. Um, Like you said, sort of mindfully in the moment, like how it was going to go and and, and within a set of parameters and boundaries, letting the kid make his his or her own choices about what what worked in that particular timeframe or what worked in that particular moment. And it went a long way in- Yes, and and what you did there was let them have their process too. You didn't leap in and just- directly teach them everything they were supposed to know about what was coming next you know you like you had patience for the fact that they were kids and that they were in process and if they made a mistake they would learn from it right now i think we have a generation of parents who are allergic to the children's mistakes you know um and they, they they have a tendency to sweep in front of them to make sure everything goes okay you know and that's actually depriving them and they don't learn their own resilience and their own strength they don't learn to problem solve and critically think and 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 find the strength within themselves to be creative and handle situations to be diplomatic to to know when to dig in and know when to let go and exactly and when they said the right thing and when they didn't i mean they're going to get responses from the world on how to interact and so we got to allow them that experience right we can't be with them forever and i think if we hang on too long we're actually handicapping them so yeah yeah from the time they were like in middle school and they would come home with a problem or they didn't like what a teacher said or what a student said, or they would have, you know, whatever interpersonal relationship issues that kids have, they'd come home and tell me and we'd 
we'd sort of make a like a mental pro con list about how to handle it. You know, if you do this, what's going to happen? If you do this, what's going to happen? Or what do you think we should do about that? Or, you know, sometimes I would say, okay, now this is really how it's going to go. You're going to go into school tomorrow. And this is what you're going to say to your teacher. Use your own words, but you're going to tell them how you feel in a respectful way and see what happens and see how you handle it. And if it doesn't go well, or if it you know, it, it, ha- it erupts in a way that you are uncomfortable with, or you need me to intervene, then I'll intervene, but I'm not intervening yet. You go handle it first. Beautiful. And, and they were just at first, you know, they're little and they're like, no, no, you do it. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I don't have a relationship with your teacher. You're the one who has the problem, not me. Yeah. You know, you go do it. And That's trusting, trusting the child to his or her own life, you know, yeah. which is beautiful. And I, I, I can count on one hand the number of times that it resulted in me intervening because they always figured out how to handle it themselves. Sometimes it would be a couple of days of back and forth with me. But, I, you know, I remember my son coming home and he was having trouble navigating whatever the problem was. I don't remember the problem, but I remember the conversation we had after. And, and it was like the second or third day where he was coming home and saying, okay, now this is what happened. What do I do now? And I, I had offered, well, do you want me to step in now? Like I did last time. And he's like, no, I got it. But I want to know, like, what do you think I should do next? I want to handle it though. And I was like, yeah, it's awesome. Beautiful. Awesome. Beautiful. <laughs> but it takes patience. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you, they, they, there's a reason a childhood is, 50 years long, you know, we, we, exactly, we exactly. learn as we go. Um, I love the Thich Nhat Hanh. He was a Vietnamese Oh, philosopher. I love him. Love He's, him. The, the phrase I love to use with parents is that a farmer does not pull on his plants to make them grow. That's true. You pull them out that way. <laughs> Right. And so, you know, it's so important where we, we don't force the development of the child because the child's guaranteed to develop, you know, they, that they can't not develop, you know, and right. And just to be even the, if you stop feeding him, he's going to grow, you know. Right, right, right. I mean, well, you got to feed him, but no, but, no, no, I'm just it was a bad metaphor. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, right. But 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 shepherding them, you know, standing alongside them as they're in process instead of expecting them to be adults when they're not adults you know i just a farmer does not pull in his plants to make them grow and you can trust them to develop just have to like be present with them as they do it absolutely it's the most amazing process you know i knew from the time i was a very little girl i would say kindergarten first grade that maybe even before that that i wanted to be a mom like i couldn't imagine myself i didn't imagine myself married or in a domestic partnership as clearly as I saw myself being a mom. Like I would arrange with my own mother to babysit for my baby dolls when I went to school (laughs) because I didn't want to leave them home, you know, like, and I would (laughs) want checklists. Like she was coming back from daycare where there wet diapers. What did she eat today? Which kind of mood she was like, I wanted (laughs) lists from my mom and she went along with me, you know, when she was in the mood too. Um, but uh, I always knew that that this was a calling for me. And uh, I would have had more kids if my uterus would have let me, but oh well. <laughs> two is enough. And then I have two, bio- uh, two step kids and five uh, uh, grandchildren by marriage. So, you know. You're good. doing all right. It's good. There's a lot of kids to love. So um, when we began this interview, I was so excited to talk to you that I skipped the icebreaker questions. <laughs> oh, well, our mess, uh, our, our mess is what makes us quirky and, and fabulous. So it is what it is. So can we ask the icebreaker questions toward the end instead? <laughs> sure. Why not? Why not? Right. It's my podcast. I can do what I want to do. Um, okay. So what six, no, what five words would you use to describe yourself? Hmm, I forgot what I wrote when you asked me that question, you but are, I guess. It's not a uh, class, Tina. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you might pick different words than you did a few days ago. I don't know. Right, right. Uh, compassion and insight, connectedness. Flexible, open-hearted. Great words. 
Great words. Great words. Um, what is your favorite way to spend a day? My favorite way to spend a day is, uh, this has happened before COVID, um, like making cookies with my grandsons and just like giving them all the jobs. And they're like, really? We get to stir it? We get to measure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that, you know, helping them discover who they are. That's just my favorite thing. That's amazing. How old are they? They're now eight, six, three, and one, the four grandchildren. Wow. All in the same family. Wow. That's a busy, that's a busy family. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> that's wonderful. And they're wonderful. They're, they're wonderful. What kind of cookies do you bake? Chocolate chip. Always? Well, pretty much. That's it. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> what my they favorite. love. That's, they're my favorite. So that's wonderful. Um, every single year for the last 19 years. This year was the 19th year in a row. My children and I bake a three-dimensional turkey cake for Thanksgiving. Oh, fun. I found a recipe in Parents Magazine when my daughter was six months old and my son was three. And I thought, we could do that. And we made a freaking mess of the kitchen. Um, Nina was in a, in a high chair playing with toys that she wasn't actively helping at six months old, but the three and a half year old was helping with some stuff. Um, and over the years, they've taken larger portions of the, okay, now you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing this. And, and at this point now I bake the cakes themselves and the kids do all of the assembly except for like the eyeballs. Cause I have a special tactic for the eyeballs with marshmallows and uh, chocolate chips and stuff. But, uh, and I do the waddle with a fruit roll up, but, uh, but it's <laughs> so fun. And in this year, you know, 19 years, I, I, you know, even in, co in COVID and in quarantine, my son stayed up at graduate school and my daughter was home. So it was just, um, just she and I doing it. And, uh, it was just amazing. I just, I just, the cooking with the kids, I find it such a basic, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, but it's almost like a, um, I, I can't find the word, but it's like a, a connective tissue in a way, you know, because it's such a basic human thing to prepare food and share food with each other. It goes back, you know, from, from the inception of life, basically. Exactly. So. Uh, I just, it's, that's amazing to me. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, okay. Your favorite childhood memory. Uh, when I was a little girl, my grandparents lived on a lake and we would go and stay in the cottage behind their big lake home for the summer. Wow. And I had a bunch of cousins who lived there and that just being with them was just heaven to me. Um, a couple of them were my age exactly, and we just got along. I, and, and we're still really close right now. So it, it, it really anchored us in each other's lives, which I am eternally grateful for. That's amazing. Do you all live near each other too? No, but we're still connected. It's really fun. Some of us live pretty close, but some are farther away, but we're still connected. That's amazing. I actually have a, we have a sort of a large family and communication is spotty sometimes and we go through certain periods I guess mostly around the Jewish holidays or sporadically throughout the year where we're more connected and then in between it it wanes a bit because everybody's lives are so busy but tonight a bunch of the cousins in my generation and although I'm a decade older than all of them we're all getting together on zoom to play some sort of game I don't exactly know what but I'm so looking forward to it it's just a, an amazing thing like this zoom thing is just revolutionary it is. Tell me what the game is after you've played it. I want to do that with my cousins too. That'd okay. be so much fun. <laughs> I will definitely share. Um, okay. Now, next question is what is your favorite meal? Anything with broiled shrimp or, or boil or sauteed shrimp. Um, I just, I just love shrimp and pasta. You know, that's just my favorite thing. Wow. Anything you can do with the shrimp and you're happy. Yep. Yep. I had a, a, a guest a, f a few episodes ago who was from Baltimore and she said that anything seafood was her favorite, especially shrimp. And she had just had shrimp before the podcast. So <laughs> I just was thinking of Shelly. 
Um, what one piece of advice would you like to give your younger self? Trust, trust your higher self, trust your source. It gets better. That's foundational. That's fabulous. I, I, yeah, trust is everything. I, I think so many people trust what they see on the outside, even if it doesn't match what's on their inside, rather than trusting their inside, and then it leads them down the wrong path. Or, or just with too much misery and that they didn't necessarily need. Right, right. I mean, that whole idea that we're doing it wrong can come from parenting that just has that message in it, you know? And what if we raised kids to think they were doing it right? You know, just think of how much more self-trust there would be. And then there's no limit to the things that they can accomplish in their lives. Absolutely, absolutely. And the amount of love they can give. I have chills now, Tina. Okay. <laughs> was- I guess we've had a successful podcast. Yay. <laughs> okay. Um, last question. What is the one thing you would like most to change about the world? I think it has to do with that individualism that we talked about early, that we would just come together and see each other as brothers and sisters and not separate from us. That's the thing that I think would drive the kind of world that I want to live in. And there are pockets of it. I see it all the time myself, and I just wish it for everybody. Yeah. I think the world would be a much better place without that. That that sense of maybe it's materialism or it's sense that, you know, my problems are more serious than your problems or, you know, that our political or racial differences or that that we allow the the differences to stand in the way of the things that we share. Exactly that. Exactly that. Community, you know, we need each other. Um, As a species, we need each other. We can't survive by ourselves. I know. So individualism was misappropriated and uh, you know just it it just doesn't help us it just doesn't help us it it tears us apart and we need yeah. we need to come together to make sure that our our planet and our hearts all survive right let's let's hope that the the pendulum is swinging towards that direction again it would be good for all of us okay last question and then i won't intrude on your friday evening anymore um what is one thing you would most like to, oh we just did that huh. i'm crazy <laughs> <laughs> i'm crazy um okay so if you what what one piece of advice or message or wisdom could you leave our amazing listeners with on this evening? I think uh, be aware of the times when you might get on the other side of the fence from your child. And try not to be on the other side of the fence from your child. Try to get back on the same side of the fence with your child. Work together toward your goal rather than judging or seeing that child as imperfect or should be different from the way he or she is. Join him or her in the present moment with love and respect and acceptance. And then you'll raise somebody who feels that toward him or herself. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Tina. This has been fabulous. I'm sure the listeners all got a lot of inspirational ideas and um, uh, relationship advice with their kids and their own parents. And uh, you've been up an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure for me too, Marcy. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs>